Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, Argentina is in mourning right now following the sudden death, which you may have heard about, of course, of Nestor Kirchner, President Christina Kirchner's husband, and himself her predecessor as president. Mr. Kirchner was expected to run again in 2011 in the presidential election. And now the question is, what impact will his death have on Christina Kirchner's ability to govern? And will she try for re-election? Joining me now to talk about that and also her recent meeting with Fidel Castro, uh, joining me now is the Director for Latin America Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, Julia Swig. Welcome back, Julia. Thank you very much for having me, Sir David. It's a joy to have you with us. The, uh, you heard the shock news, shock news to, to everyone. Um, do you think that in Argentina that Cristina can run the, run the country without the very, very important help she received from her husband? Well, I, <clears throat> I think it's too early to speculate, and I, I, I have to say my feminist impulse hears that question and responds, well, by all means. She's been <laughs> running the country, of course, with her husband for some time helping her, but my guess is that um, this has the potential either to open up politics or to solidify her standing, and I think only time will tell how that unfolds. There's a history of, of, of women running Argentina in the wake of their husband's deaths, after all. I'm thinking here of yes. Evita Perón. Um, Kirsch Kirchner, on the other hand, Cristina has served as president uh, for some time now, so, so I don't think there's any reason to assume that this would seriously undermine her, although it could, the, it could their party, and it could bring a more diverse political environment uh, to Argentina in its wake. And uh, you were talking there with your liberated musing about uh, the one woman going on on her own. Do you think that, in fact, uh, the president would want to go on on her own in the elections next year or not? Or is it just too early to say? Well, I think it's too early to say, but I, I think one observation I, I would have as a historian and a political scientist is that people don't easily walk away from power and the presidency um, if she has the opportunity to uh, stay in politics. My goodness, why wouldn't she? Talking of the end of political careers or political careers that go on indefinitely and so on, um, how did you come to have your reunion, your re-meeting um, with Fidel, Fidel Castro? It was a couple of months ago. Was it planned for many, many months and many, many years? What happened? No, David, not for many years and not for many months. I was planning to go to Cuba in August. I go there a couple of times a year. And um, Fidel Castro, the previous month, over the summer, made his first public appearance, gave a speech in the National Assembly about his worries about conflict and escalation in the Middle East. And just after that, my friend Jeff Goldberg, a journalist with The Atlantic, published an article called The Coming War. I think that's the title. And it was also about the Middle East and Iran and the potential for nuclear conflict. Fidel saw the article. I um, got a call asking if I could help track down Goldberg. Goldberg's a friend of mine, and it all came together very quickly. Uh, we went together, and what was to be a trip independently of mine without seeing Fidel Castro turned into a few days of interviewing him with Jeff Goldberg. Goldberg then left, and I spent a couple of more days uh, talking with and um, spending some time interviewing Fidel Castro myself. And uh, how did you find him in the sense, is he, everyone wonders about his health, is he in pretty good health at the moment? I thought I found him to be in extraordinarily good health, and and he talked at great length actually about the um, physical odyssey he's experienced of the last four years since he became sick. Uh, he is recovered. He is um, eating, drinking, sleeping, walking, talking, writing history, uh, entertaining, visiting guests again, something that he used to do when he was president. And by entertaining, I mean sitting for long hours and talking about history and politics and the world. And I found him to be in very, very good form. And in terms of the quote we've heard about him saying here, the Cuban model doesn't even work for us anymore. Does he feel that, do you think? 
Well, it's always it's always tough to to talk about what people feel, but uh, you know, that quote was reported around the world and made a big splash. But the truth is, as I follow Cuba very very closely, the the ineffectiveness and non functionality of the Cuban model for Cuba has been something that. Fidel, before he stepped down, and then his brother Raul, now president, and everybody top to bottom in and out of government in Cuba has been talking about for years. The economic model doesn't work, and in fact, his brother Raul Castro, the, now the president, is in the process of attempting to change it. So does Fidel feel that it doesn't work? I, I, I suspect he does. He said it. Now, however, as you know, a week after we were there and made that, and, and Jeff reported that quote, Fidel made a second public appearance at the University of Havana saying, I was quoted accurately, but I was misinterpreted. And then he went on to say, David, um, in, in so many words, just because we may change our model doesn't mean we're going to import theirs, meaning the American capitalist system. Um, which is a valid thing for him to say, given the 50 years that he's been uh, stating that the American capitalist system wouldn't possibly work for Cuba. That was said for domestic consumption, understandably so, as Raul undertakes to push aside or maneuver around vested interests who are pre prefer the status quo, but the status quo no longer works. And I think that's what everyone's just talking about there. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for all your insights about life and love and the world. We're always having a joy of talking to your good self. Thanks a million. Lovely to see you, Sir David. Thanks so much. And now, it's one of the iconic designs of the 20th century. It's cheap, powerful, easy enough for a child to use, light enough for a child to carry, and it's virtually indestructible. A perfect toy, you might think, but no. I'm talking about the AK-47 assault rifle. Designed, or partially designed, we'll find out in a minute, by Mikhail Kalashnikov. In 1947, it's been carried by virtually every revolutionary rebel and thug since then. It decorates flags, postage stamps, even vodka bottles, and the videos of Osama bin Laden as well. And while peace protesters around the world worry about nuclear proliferation, the Kalashnikov is said to kill more people every year than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together. I'm joined now by New York Times reporter C.J. Chivers, whose biography of, uh, of the subject that I'm just talking about, the gun, is right here. This extraordinary weapon, this rather malignant weapon as well, of course. Uh, anyway, he's here right now. C.J. Chivers, Chris, um, what is your attitude now to, to this gun and to the man who gave us this gun? Well, I don't see it really as being given to us by a man. It was, it's more the product of, of, a, of a system. You know, the planned economy produced these by the tens of millions. And it's not the individual guns that are the problem. It's, it's the extraordinary quantity that causes the problems. And the quantity, would you blame... Russia for not keeping it more under wraps or something? I mean, who's to blame for the spread of the Kalashnikov? In, in many ways, history's to blame. The, the, the weapons spread uh, through the sort of standardization of arms that were used by the Eastern Bloc, and one factory after another opened up in, in socialist, you know, Eastern Bloc armies. And as these weapons accumulated, it turned out that the countries that were holding on to them were quite brittle, and so they fell apart. Uh, and after the Cold War came to its end, these weapons began to circulate in extraordinary quantities. Now, they were, of course, circulating before, but in smaller numbers than they do now. And so it's all of these factors together that have given, them, you know, given us this outsized quantity of weapons that are in the field today. And why, why is it so successful? I mean, is it an outstanding piece of engineering, albeit a malignant one, or what? Well, it's, it's, it's a number of things that make this weapon so useful for what it's designed to do, which is to kill people. Uh, it's, it's relatively small. It has relatively light recoil. It's very easy to use. And then there's this other factor, which is it's extraordinarily durable. It lasts and lasts once it gets out uh, into the hands of guerrillas or criminals. And so all of these things come together to make it you know, very, very effective in a way that many other, many other weapons are not. 
you mentioned, we mentioned obviously Kalashnikov, the man. I remember once when I was interviewing uh, the father of the H-bomb, uh, Edward Teller, and uh, I was talking to him and at one point he said, I wish the world would not call me the father of the H-bomb because my son is always saying, you know, why do they say that about you? What does that make me if you're the father of the H-bomb and so on? Is it a, an ugly thing for a man like Kalashnikov to be credited with this, do you think? Or do you think he takes pride or shame? He said on one occasion he implied that he was trying to change the images I, I think, of Kalashnikov. But. Well, I think Kalashnikov's own relationship to the weapon is quite conflicted. He is credited with its design, but of course he didn't design it himself. Uh, the weapon is really a testament to collective, uh, to collective engineering. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of people involved in, in fine-tuning this weapon and bringing it to form. Now, now Kalashnikov has, uh, has he's sort of a funny take on this. And when the weapon does something, of, you know, of which he approves, he thinks that he should take credit for the weapon. And when the weapon is used in ways that he does not approve of, that are untoward or, or you know, in any way related to crime and terrorism and the like, he then distances himself from the weapon and says that, well, it's really the politician's fault, not mine. As he designed this, he knew he was producing a murderous weapon to kill as many people as possible. So it wasn't a surprise to him that it was used like that. He should have stopped if he didn't want it to be used in that way. Well, you know, you could take any one person out of this equation and this, and this rifle probably still would have been brought uh, into existence. This was, again, a collective effort by a design bureau and by a sort of constellation of designers and industrial enterprises in the Soviet Union that, that brought this thing forward. So to, to burrow down on any one man and not recognize really that this is the product of a system, I, I think is to sort of misplace both the origins of the weapon and the responsibility for its proliferation. Thank you very much, Chris, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for having me, David. And that's it for this week. But please do join us again for much more Frost Over the World in seven days from now. Bye for now.